Hey everyone, thanks for joining us again. This is uh, our next episode. We're going to basically talk about uh, what is compliance. Um, last episode, we talked about what is cybersecurity. And uh, in extremely high level, this time we're going to talk about what is compliance at a, at a very high level. <clears throat> and again, the idea is not to get in the weeds. We're going to do that later. We want to just bring people up to speed at an extremely high level so we can uh, have more in-depth conversations later on. So for today's uh, conversation, hopefully not as long as the last one, uh, we're going to talk about what is compliance. So what is compliance? Well, it's really kind of simple. In a nutshell, it's doing what you're supposed to be doing as it relates to a few factors. One of those factors could be a regulatory environment uh, like HIPAA, PCI, GDPR, CCPA, uh, whatever. It could be any of those. Uh, could be being compliant with a security framework like NIST 800-171 or NIST 800-53. It could be being compliant uh, with contracts. So essentially compliance in a nutshell is doing what you're supposed to be doing and, uh, and sticking with it. Um, one, of the, one of the services that Arrakis offers is <clears throat> we, uh, we help companies get compliant with whatever regulatory environment they're beholden to. And then we help them through the audit. Uh, if there's a specific audit or an investigation uh, or whatever, maybe they want to get certified in something like ISO 27001 or SOC 2, we'll help them get compliant and we'll stand shoulder to shoulder with them during the audit process that leads to their certification. Thankfully, we have a 100% success rate on every single client we've helped through through the process that we've implemented. And then after they're certified, um, so they've demonstrated compliance at that particular point in time, or maybe a, a range of two dates, they've demonstrated compliance. <clears throat> and then after they've been certified, then they want to stay compliant. They want to stay certified. So com we help them with that as well as we help help a company stay compliant. Um, the last thing you want to do is spend a lot of money getting compliant and then kind of view it like, oh, okay, there's the finish line. I'm good. I'm not going to worry about this until the next time the audit comes around because that costs a lot more money. So again, what is compliance is basically doing what you're supposed to be doing in relation to some sort of regulatory environment. Now, uh, companies can have situations where they also have to be compliant with contracts, uh, contractual relationships with uh, customers of some sort. And it's vital that when, you know, if you have a company that's uh, engaging customers and you're signing contracts, it's vital that you actually review those contracts and understand exactly what they mean. In one case, we had a customer that uh, the salespeople were just signing contracts right and left without reading them. And uh, we suspected there was an issue with the, from the contractual standpoint. So what we did is we took every single contract, we basically laid them on top of each other and came up with a worst case scenario of what this company had to do. And it turns out this company uh, signed a contract that required, or that allowed, not required, that allowed their client to come in with zero notice, a zero day uh, notice to come in and perform a complete cybersecurity audit. That's a pretty bad situation to be in. While you may be regulatory compliant, uh, if you're not contractually compliant, you can still get in, in an equal amount of, of trouble. So we want to we want to be, you know, understanding of what our, our our environments are that we have to be beholden to. And again, regulatory situations or security framework situations are just are just one of those. So, in relation to regulatory compliance specifically, it's not like we can talk about contractual compliance because contracts can be written all sorts of different ways. Regulatory environments are fixed; they're published. It's 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 published across the planet. It's very clear what they are. It's important to understand that regulatory requirements <clears throat> are the minimum acceptable standards that a company needs to follow 
in order to uh, you know pass pass the regulatory viewpoint. So, for example, if if a regulatory environment said your passwords have to be at least eight characters long, that doesn't mean you have to pick eight character passwords. You can do 10, 12, 16, whatever you want. It just can't be less than whatever they're requiring. So, and it's the same thing on encryption. If your encryption, it says you must have encryption. Well, if they don't define the encryption, that's a problem with the regulatory environment. If they do define the encryption, let's say you must have encryption, it must be AES-128. And then you say, well, I don't like 128. I want to do 256 because I don't want to have to worry about it when they make a change to the environment certainly acceptable to do that so what we don't as a as consultants we like to remind our clients of this and what we want to ensure that does happen is that a company is at least made available or may at least made a you know understands that you can actually do more than what the regulatory environment suggests and in some cases you really want to do more because it may cost more money to change later on. So uh, encryption's a big one. Uh, back in the day, you could have sensitive data and not have encrypted hard drives. Well, encrypted hard drives are practically required in everything we do now. So, you know, you should encrypt your hard drives where you can. Well, what if you can't encrypt hard drives? That puts the company in a position where we have to come up with compensating controls or another way of putting it in layman's terms, some other solution that allows us to meet the regulatory requirement without possibly buying a whole bunch of brand new computers that allow for encrypted hard drives. So there's quite a different thing, a uh, whole set of different things that we can do. But it is important to understand that regulatory environments, they are the minimum requirements. And if at all possible, we always suggest that you do more than the minimum. I mean, after all, none of us went to college so we can make a 70 on all our tests and uh, barely pass. I mean, we tried hard in college and university to, to make A's in the highest grade we can, and it doesn't really you know, change here. So there are some examples that all regulatory environments uh, do require, and I'm not going to touch on every single thing, but a, a lot of them. So first one is antivirus. There's no regulatory environment that doesn't require antivirus of some sort. Now there are loopholes around uh, around this, uh, and there are also more strict requirements also around this. So, for example, if you're <clears throat> if you're doing anything for the U.S. government, you absolutely cannot use Kaspersky antivirus. Absolutely can't do it. It's it would be a, a, a direct violation of a pres presidential order. Um, specifically because Kaspersky has, uh, you know, KGB, FSB uh, connections and so on. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that a medical office couldn't use Kaspersky um, to, to manage their, their office. Not saying it's a good idea, because um, I don't think it would be a good idea, but that doesn't mean that a medical, like a doctor's office, a small doctor's office somewhere, couldn't use Kaspersky and still meet the requirements from HIPAA. So it, it is what it is, It's but it is something to, you know, think about. Now, also in relation to antivirus, uh, there's a lot of companies out there, and strangely enough, a lot of them are medical. Uh, they go with the concept of, well, I can, why should I pay for antivirus when I can get it for free? Okay, well, just understand if you do that, first off, bad idea. Second off, if you need support, from this free antivirus company, you're probably not going to get it. And it's important to understand that if you have an issue and you're not going to get the support that you'd like to get, then you you may have a you know you may have an issue. Other areas in relation to antivirus as it relates to uh, you know the the uh, regulations is that you have to make sure that not only do you have antivirus, but you're also making sure that the definitions, the antivirus definitions are being updated and there's some sort of alerting and reporting uh, feature that goes on. But again, there there are loopholes around this that, you know, Arrakis, uh, if, you, if you're interested, if you have a situation, 
we'll be happy to help you, help you out. You can reach out to us at sales at arrakisconsulting.com. Uh, all right, another area of uh, required for all regulatory environments is uh, computer security awareness training. And when I say all regulatory, I'm talking about all the big ones, you know, HIPAA, PCI, GDPR, things like that, but also the uh, not regulatory, but security framework environments like ISO 27001 or SOC 2. All of that requires computer security awareness training. Now, an episode, the last episode we did where we talked about what is cybersecurity, I talked a lot about threats like human based threats and how and I specifically said uh, the human being is the strongest link and the weakest link in the cybersecurity chain at the same time. So you have to understand that computer security awareness training is always going to be something that has to be done, has to be done at least annually, has to be tested, test your people to make sure they were paying attention, they understand uh, what's going on. However, do any of the regulatory uh, environments or the security frameworks say that the computer security awareness training has to be good? Absolutely not. You could get the cheapest computer security awareness training uh, out there, have people go through this training, have them check the box or sign a sign-in sheet or whatever. Uh, you could hire somebody to come in and do it. Um, it could be anything. And from the regulatory standpoint alone, you would be compliant. Now, is that a good idea? Absolutely not. Absolutely not a good idea at all. You wouldn't want to do the bare minimum on security awareness training when you know full well, after I just got through saying it, so I'll say it again, the human being is the strongest and the weakest link in cybersecurity. You wanna get some quality cybersecurity awareness training uh, to, to help your company out. And again, Arrakis has partnered with numerous companies that can that can help in this area. And the way we do things for cybersecurity awareness training, um, we have a, a method uh, where it's less of an impact. I certainly think it's less boring um, and it's more effective and it requires constant engagement by the by the end user, which you know reduces the risk that the end user bears by clicking the link or not clicking the link. But from a regulatory standpoint, you could get the crappiest uh, awareness training that there is, make your people go through it, and so long as they were there going through the training, then you technically are compliant. Um, because again, there's no regulatory environment that says it has to be good training, it has to cover specific areas. It just says you have to have computer security awareness training, and then they kind of leave it up to the company uh, to figure it out. Some regulatory environments also have a data loss protection. Um, it kind of depends on what regulatory environment you're, you're in, uh, <clears throat> but not all regulatory environments require that. Uh, not all security frameworks require that. The new uh, ISO 27001 uh, colon 2022, the new one, it does require it because the 27001 uh, the new version of 27001 is clearly uh, designed to be more aligned with GDPR for privacy related reasons. But some, some, re some uh, you know, regulatory environments do not require it and you don't really have to do it. So that's, that's good to know. Now I, I will point out, uh, if you're required to do DLP or data loss protection, you really want to plan this out before you implement it. Uh, DLP can help your company greatly. If it's misconfigured uh, or overly strict or doesn't learn enough about the environment or you don't discover enough about the, the client environment, then you actually can do more harm than good. There's been cases where companies have been shut down because DLP was so strict that the company could not operate. And of course, there's a lot of frustration there and they eventually just turn the whole thing off and accept the risk that, well, if anybody catches us, then, you know, we'll just explain what happened. 
Well, realistically, if you're so, if you're required to have DLP and you turn it off, and then you explain to them, well, it was too hard to work with, or it caused problems, so we just turned it off, and we're just explaining it to you, what we did. Another way of saying that is, is um, basically admitting to <laughs> breaking the regulation, and uh, and you don't really want to do that. So, but. So with DLP, data loss protection, you want to make sure that it's properly thought out and, and implemented the, the right way. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the DLP solution that we offer for within Arrakis is, uh, is certainly effective, and there's, there's a reason why we use this, this particular uh, type of DLP and that you know, we specifically offer it to, to our customers because it's it meets the requirements, but it's less of a threat as other DLP solutions. You also have to understand <clears throat> uh, encryption. There's no regulatory environment that doesn't require encryption. Uh, and not only just normal encryption, but encryption at rest, encryption in transit. Um, so that's super important. So as a cybersecurity professional, you really want to understand how encryption works. You want to understand the the type, the, the types of encryption that are required. And <clears throat> if there are situations where you have to figure something out, then then you, you know, you're gonna have to figure out an alternate plan. And those alternating alternate plans could be uh, known as compensating controls. So like if you can't do something that you're supposed to do, you have this compensating control that accomplishes the same mission but not in the same way. Super important to understand uh, the wording of the regulatory environment you are in. Uh, so for example, if it says shall, that means it's required. It's, it's not an option. If it says should, that means it's optional. So you'll see in regulatory environments, it'll say something like sensitive data shall be encrypted. And what this means to companies is that it will be done and if it's not done then you're not compliant and you could be facing you know sanctions uh, fines penalties of some sort things like that <clears throat> and there's really no there's really no excuse in in relation to what they require of you if you want to maintain that that certification or even get certified you know the first time now but it's also important to understand the should like you should do this. Should's an optional word. It, it means you have the option of pick. But if we think about it, if if we should do something, and that something's going to help the company, it's affordable. It's within the budget. It's going to help the company. It's going to make us look better. Things like that. I would encourage you to do it. Um, we don't really want to not do something that we should do don't have to but we should do it if it's going to provide a benefit to the company now obviously if there's a should option in whatever they require of you and it's you know it's going to cost a lot of money uh, or it's going to cost to, or require a lot of effort that is unachievable by the company then maybe the company should see what I did there uh, consider it and and decide whether they will do it or not Having said that, <clears throat> generally, with regulatory environments, if it says should on one version, the upgraded version, which can take you know four, five, six, seven, eight years to come into play, if it says should, it's probably going to be shall on the next time around. So you don't really be, want to be caught with your pants down when the new version comes out. You want to. You want to be ahead of the game as, as much as you can just to you know help yourself out and save save a lot of time and money because once a new version comes out and should becomes a shall it might be more expensive and it might be much more expensive in not only cost but also effort to implement because your company may have matured significantly you know by then also super important to understand the, the word state of the art. Uh, there are a few regulations out there that uh, indicate state of the art. Um, and this is, this is a, a little bit of ambiguity. So 
what exactly does state of the art mean? Does that mean like whatever is available over the counter, uh, you know, off the shelf? Uh, does that mean NSA level stuff? Does it mean you have to have quantum supercomputers in order to run your antivirus program? Uh, so it's really, you have to understand the, the, the wording behind these things to make sure that it's, it's legitimate. Um, I'll, I'll go into a regulation later on, not today, that specifically has this in, in as a wording around or similar to that in, in the regulation. But <clears throat> the idea behind using state of the art in, in uh, a regulation is, is clearly from the people who wrote the, the regulation is they don't want to have to rewrite it. So they just say state of the art. But some of these regulations don't define what state of the art is. Again, does that mean for antivirus, I have to have seven quantum computers all running in parallel to run my antivirus program for my computer? It's really up to the interpreter. It's up to the person who's reading it to have to implement the solution to become compliant. It's up to the investigator, the auditor, or the regulator that's that's looking into what happened with a company or making sure they're safe or, or whatever. So it's super important to literally legally or not legally, but literally look at the regulation and look at it from a legal standpoint. What exactly are they saying? And if it's not obvious to you, then we obviously, Arrakis obviously suggests that you reach out to somebody else and get their opinion. Um, there's a there's a lot of law firms out there that can help you you know decipher some of this stuff but there's also a lot of cybersecurity companies that can help you decipher it Arrakis is, is one of them <clears throat> so why isn't there more detail uh, in exactly what can happen if or what you should do or what can happen if you're not compliant well it, it's it's pretty simple first off uh, regulations are always behind the power curve. Uh, ISO 27000 2022, the previous version was 2013. So a lot of years went by before 2022 came out. They may have talked about it, but they didn't implement it um, and so on. So regulations are always behind. Technology is always ahead of whatever regulation is, is required. And that kind of goes back to the other point. Regulations are designed to meet the minimum standards. So <clears throat> if you're using new technology, but an outdated regulation or a regulation that has been updated lately, picking the minimum standards to uh, do something is, is really even worse than just picking the minimum standards. So we should go above and beyond every chance we can get. Um, another, another reason is um, the people who write regulations can't really get into great detail. So I previously mentioned, uh, you know, all regulatory environments require antivirus. And I said, you know, if you're doing work for the US government, you can't use Kaspersky. But if you're a, you know, a small medical shop or a small this or a small that, you could use Kaspersky all you want and you'd be, you'd be compliant. The, the problem with specifying in great detail in regulations is it could be perceived that the people who wrote the regulation are trying to align themselves with one specific vendor. And that's not good for a competitive environment. It just creates problems on the political landscape. You know, people get, ac uh, get accused of corruption, you know, you know, things like that. So that's why they can't be in great detail exactly how things are are supposed to be and that's you know and it does cause some some confusion amongst companies like well how do I do this it doesn't say it just says I have to have an antivirus well what does that mean uh, it says I have to do logging and monitoring what does that mean it says I have to have uh, NTP or a singular time source in in place but what is a singular time source what is a time source how do I make it a singular time source you know things like that so a lot of these regulations not only require a person or a company that can handle from the, the legal, the regulatory standpoint, but a lot of these companies that 
like Arrakis that help out clients, we, not only do we have to understand the regulatory side, we also have to understand the technical side of things that, that can uh, kind of translate what they mean uh, from regulatory or legal into technical so we can accomplish regulatory and legal. So it's, it's kind of an interesting, interesting thing. Anyways, they can't specify in great detail because, because of that. And then the other standpoint is nobody really knows what's going to happen tomorrow in relation to technology. Uh, somebody could come up with something new right away that they just didn't think of. I mean, as of, <clears throat> as of this recording, I think Chat AI or Chat, Chat GPT has come out and it's a popular thing in the news right now and so on. And apparently people are submitting uh, theses and everything else using this artificial intelligence to write their thesis. And um, nobody would have thought about that, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, so it's, it's just something that the, everybody in the world's going to have to get used to. So as a technologist, a cybersecurity guy, a uh, person who looks at regulations, realistically, you, you, can't, you can't become uh, laser focused in any one area. You have to focus on all, all areas at the same time in order to, you know, be effective. Uh, so, <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? So we talked about in the cybersecurity side of things, <clears throat> what could go wrong. We talked about financial uh, impacts like penalties, fines, uh, things like that. You know, I, I think I gave an example somewhere that you know you could PCI you get fined by the day. You could you can make a mistake and have a court order that says unless you do this, you're gonna pay thousands of dollars every day until you can prove that you've done it. So there's a, a tremendous amount of things that can happen in relation to you know to compliance. We have fines. You can have civil charges filed against you, civil lawsuits. You can have criminal charges filed against you. Uh, so some of the countries that fall under the GDPR landscape, um, some of those countries, like first time, you just, it's just a crazy large fine. Second time, you're going to prison. Uh, and in other countries, it's you go straight to prison. Um, it's, it's kind of the same thing in the U.S. in some areas. So we really want to totally be up to speed on what can go wrong so we can evaluate what can go wrong with what it takes to not go wrong, to understand our risk, our financial risk, our reputational risk, things like that, as well as what's it going to what's it going to take to fix the problem so we can be compliant? I mean, you know, again, if we're if we're a company that's, you know, running Kaspersky currently and we want to do business with the U.S. government and we have a thousand people in the company. Well, before we can even bid on anything, we're going to have to replace Kaspersky completely across a thousand computers and servers and everything else. So just to do business in some cases, you know, you're going to have to make changes as a company. Whistleblowing. Oh, my gosh. So whistleblowing is a uh, fairly significant uh, thing uh, to consider, and especially based on the type of company you're or type of environment you're in type of company you are what your industry is stuff like that so with whistleblowing a lot of times uh in a in a regulatory environment that allows whistleblowing the this will probably be a disgruntled person that works for you um in on a, in almost all cases whistleblowing is a big deal because when somebody blows the whistle on whatever the company's not doing, there may be uh, situations where not only will you face fines and everything else, but a portion of those fines actually become a bonus, a reward to the whistleblower. So if I remember correctly, and maybe I'm not, but I think in like 2019 or some year, it's, it's fairly recent, that the U.S. Department of Justice awarded like three billion dollars in whistleblowing rewards to to people that you know basically turn turn their company in. And here's the thing about whistleblowing: you can have them sign an NDA all day long, 
But if you're breaking the law or you're doing something that is uh, contractually not compliant and so on, then you might not have any recourse, um, you know, but to pay them. You might, you might not have any ability to go after somebody who blows the whistle on you uh, specifically. It's just, a, it's just a crazy amount. And if you think about it, you know, if you, if you uh, and I want to say it's like, I don't remember the percentage for whistleblowing. I think the Department of Justice, just, Justice is like between 3 and 12% of whatever the fine would be. I, I don't remember, but the, it's a percentage that whoever blows the whistle, it's a percentage of a reward that they get. But it is significant. And in, in some cases, depending on the fine, uh, somebody blows the whistle on a company, they literally may retire just off of the reward. So super important to be compliant because not only do you have regulatory agents, agencies looking at you, you could have your own people looking at you to seek out opportunities to blow the whistle. You also have reputational impacts. And, and so in the previous episode we talked about where we talked about what is cybersecurity, uh, we talked about target and the target breach. The target breach is still being discussed amongst the cyber cybersecurity community. Um, there are other breaches that are, you know, certainly there. Equifax, for example. You got Equifax, you got Target. LastPass is a big thing right now. Uh, in Arizona, there is the Maricopa Community College breach. It was all horrible things that, that happened. Some of these things don't really go away uh, for, for quite some time. So it, it's super important to understand that not only can a situation, because you're not compliant with a regulatory or a security framework, um, you know, making mistakes can cost you not only money in immediately, but also over the also over the long term. So, in relation to Target, uh, initially, you know, they, they I, I want to say they had to pay like 19 million to the state's attorney generals for the various states. But in in 2013, Target estimated that they lost uh, 148 million in 2013. But by the time it got to 2015, because of all the things that happened, reputational, financial, all the stuff they had to do to fix the problem, it was over 250 million. So you have to think for your company, regardless of what your industry is, what your company does, things like that, given everything that could happen, civil, financial, fines, civil and criminal, possibly charges, the whistleblowing effect, maybe, things like that. Is it really cheaper to not do something that you know you're supposed to be doing only to have to face a much larger, a much larger situation uh, in the end? And then that's, that's the effect of you know, loss of revenue. Then you're gonna spend more money on top of that to change that reputation around as opposed to just continually losing money, you're gonna spend more money to you know, spin out a new advertising campaign or talk about this or talk about that. So in reality, it's, it's actually fairly, fairly significant. And then we also have third party oversight. Uh, much like I said in the last episode, you know, what is cybersecurity? You really don't wanna have a lot of third party oversight. I mean, there's gonna be some third party interactions you're gonna have auditors, like if you wanna get your 27,001 certification, you're gonna have an external entity come in to audit you. Same thing with the SOC too. Um, your, you know, almost all regulatory environments require some sort of, you know, uh, penetration test, which is gonna be done by a third party. So they're gonna come in and do these things, but you can also require those people to sign non-disclosures and prohibit them from discussing anything they ever did. But if you get breached, you can't make an FBI agent sign a non-disclosure on, on your breach. He's going to come in and he's going to look at you and he's going to go through all your stuff to see what's going on. And if the breach uh, ever gets to the court system because of the numerous civil or criminal you know, uh, charges filed, now it's public knowledge. And the, the court system very well may order... Uh, 
as a part of public knowledge, the court system very well may order a third party to come in and audit you or provide oversight and then provide reports to the court. And unless there's a sufficient legal cause, then that's going to be public knowledge. We really, as companies, you really don't want to have outside parties poking around and getting into your business. You want to keep as much of that stuff uh, private as, as possible. And if there's anything else that they happen to find, you know, they in some cases they may be legally obligated, uh, you know, to do something about it. Now, uh, you can also have uh, a situation around attestations. Uh, and an attestation is where you have um, you have a company that says it's doing something or it's whether it's doing something or not is irrelevant, but it signs a document. It attests to being compliant. It attests to doing what it's supposed to be doing and things like that. But if that attestation is less than truthful, then that is uh, also uh, punishable. It's 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 fairly significant. <clears throat> what you don't want to do is ever have an attestation or provide an attestation that you're doing something when you're really not doing it because you know everywhere else that's called lying uh, and in some cases you know fraud charges could be filed so we, we want to absolutely make sure that if we're testing to anything it's a truthful attestation and again going back to the to the government um, you know, if I was to pick on the CMMC regulatory environment, um, in the CMMC environment, you can, a company can attest that they are compliant. So, awesome. They attest that they're compliant. Uh, you know, they submit it. They're in, the, they're in the marketplace as being compliant, things like that. So, everything's good. Well, what if they're not compliant? Uh, but they wrote that anyways. What if they say, yeah, we're compliant, no one's ever gonna find out, and they submit that, and people who do business for the US government that does business with them says, we're gonna take you for your word that you're compliant. And then it turns out that they're not compliant. That is called a violation of the False Claims Act. And when I mentioned before about whistleblowing and the Department of Justice and things like that, the False Claims Act is a huge part of whistleblowing. And it's it's vital, again, it's vital. If you're gonna test to something, it must be accurate. Uh, otherwise, you, you know, you could be, could be facing uh, a lot of situations that are negative to the human being and the company. All right, and with that, I will uh, let you guys go. Um, thank you for joining us again. As always, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, please uh, let us know your opinions and comments. And again, just like everything else, uh, right now we're just doing high level uh, reviews of different things, or different concepts, different discussions and so on. Uh, so we're gonna get in the weeds later on. I believe the next, uh, the next session we're gonna talk about is going to be uh, what is privacy, which probably won't be very long, uh, but what is privacy, and then we start digging into, into a little bit more into the weeds on some of the other things. So with that, I thank everybody for the time. Please leave your comments and suggestions on future things to talk about, and I will see you guys later.